stand against the Lord. No one can. No one will. Who will stand against the King? No one can. No one It's another day's journey, or should I say another week's journey, and I'm glad about it. Thank God for another day. Thank God for another week and another opportunity to celebrate our God who lives and shall not die as we worship God in residence. I miss you at all, and I hope that you miss me as well, and we can't wait until uh, God gives us uh, uh, the opportunity to have a family reunion. What a time that will be. But until then, let's continue to uh, be reminded that we have a Christ who can handle our crisis. As we walk through the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, I invite you to turn with me to chapter 14. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about faith for the finish line. He gives us faith for the finish line. Let's uh, join in prayer for just a moment as we are about to go into this time of, uh, of study uh, in God's word. Father, we give you praise and thank you for this time that you have carved out for us to be walking, talking, visible manifestations, representatives of the glory of your grace. Thank you for redeeming us and changing our lives and giving us uh, the privilege of representing you. Teach us what that means and give us faith for the finish line. Cause us, Lord, to, to endure in the midst of challenges to um, throw in the towel and, and the temptation to say that it, this stuff ain't worth it. Overcome all of that and allow the vision that we have of you to eclipse all that is before us that causes us to sit on the bleachers and throw in the towel. 
I pray, Father, for our children. Thank you for them, as many of them are going back to school now. I pray for every parent uh, that has to make decisions and every teacher, every principal, every board member, all of those who are involved in planning for the children's safety as well as their um, cultivating them in terms of preparing them for the next season of their life. Give to them the wisdom that they need for this moment in time. I pray for our children. I pray that you'll protect them and I pray that you will grace them with the ability to be able to learn, to grow, and to develop. And I pray that you will uh, take those lives, confiscate them, so that all that they learn will be seen in light of their relationship with you. Cause them to know who you are. And those who do, I pray that you will make them agents of grace even now, that they can share Jesus Christ even with their friends. Turn this Lord into a moment where you are the spotlight, you are glorified. I pray that as in this preaching moment, you will, as you have breathed out your word, breathe into us by the illuminating power of your spirit. Do what preaching in and of itself cannot do. Cause us to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Faith for the finish line. Revelation chapter uh, 14. Last week we dealt with this uh, pimping uh, prophet uh, the and then the week before the Antichrist. So you have the Antichrist and the Anti Prophet, and in chapter thirteen. But chapter thirteen should never be read in isolation. Chapter thirteen should always be read in connection with chapter fourteen, because in chapter thirteen, where you have the beast, in chapter fourteen you have the lamb. Chapter thirteen you have the enemy. But chapter 14, you have the conquering king and you should never settle for a vision of what your enemy is doing without this greater vision of your conquering Christ. And that's what we have today. Faith for the finish line, Revelation chapter 14, and we have a vision of the lamb. He fast forwards us into the future. Let's see. Chapter 14, verse one. Do you have it? It says, then I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters. Think about that roar of many waters. Think how loud you ever been out to a beach somewhere and uh, you heard the uh, the water, think about the roar of many waters. Think about how that would sound. Uh, and like a sound of loud thunder. Think how that sound in connection with the roaring waters. Allow yourself to sense that. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found for they are blameless. Let's just deal with that verses one through five. Uh, and what we have here is faith for the finish line, faith for the finish line. What I want to say today is that God will give you a preview of uh, of your victory to reaffirm your faith. God will give you a preview of your victory to reaffirm your faith. Let's say that one more time. God will give you a preview of your victory in order to reaffirm your faith. And in this text, after we've seen chapter 12 with the dragon and after we've seen in chapter 13 with the antichrist beast and the anti-prophet 
the false prophet and the enemy and what he has done uh, or what he is going to do now in chapter 14. He says, now that you've seen the beast at work, I'm going to fast forward you to the future and show you what victory ultimately will look like. And the reason I'm showing you this is not so you can play this game about Am I one of the 144,000 and what's the number of the beast? Is it in my on my driver's license and trying to figure everything out and turn this thing into a puzzle? Um, that's not the point. The point is, let me fast forward you to the future of the lamb in victory, because in the midst of the enemy, and his deception and his destruction and his attack, I don't want to get you so inundated with the fact that your enemy is busy, that you forget the fact that your king will gain victory. Never read chapter 13 or chapter 12 in isolation without chapter 14. And it is in chapter 14 that we see God gives a preview of your victory in order to reaffirm your faith. The reason why you can endure now is because you understand uh, that this thing is worth it. I used to run track. That was my sport. My sport was track. I did the uh, 800 and sometimes I did the uh, mile. And um, after that first lap and when you're coming around and you're about to do that second lap, something starts happening. Well, at least it started happening to me. And one of the things that the coaches would always tell us, this is when you feel like you about to give up and you and, and you, it starts to wear on you. First thing, do not start looking. Never look behind and never look to the side. You always keep looking forward with your mind and your eye on the finish line. Looking back or looking to the side will not only slow you down, but it will distract you. Don't keep your mind. Understand that you got some opponents. You understand that you got some other folk racing who are trying to uh, beat you and whatnot. Don't, don't understand that, but don't allow in your race to be so distracted that you give more attention to those who are against you than you do to the finish line. And as I envision the finish line, it gives me the second win that I need to endure the race. Like so in this text, I'm going to let you know in 12 and 13 that you do have enemies. There is a dragon. There is a real Satan. There is a beast that is coming, a false antichrist who will counterfeit the true and the living God. There is a false prophet that is coming who will uh, deceive the world and bring massive uh, rebellion and uh, a worship that is wrapped up in wickedness and all of that. Yeah, that is coming. I want you to be aware that you are in the middle of a of, of a battleground. But in the midst of that, you cannot lose focus and be so preoccupied with your enemy that you forget the fact that you have a conquering king. And the way the conquering king gives you victory or gives you faith to endure is by fast forwarding you to the future and saying, this is where I'm taking you. And since you're going to win and you will be with me, then everything you go through is worth it. God will give you a preview of your victory in order to uh, reaffirm your faith. Two things I want you to see here. Uh, I want you to see the vision of the conquering king. And then I want you to see the value uh, given to the conquering king. The vision of the conquering king as well as the value of the conquering king. Well, let's see. Verse, verse 1 and following, the vision of of this conquering king. Then I looked and behold on Mount Zion. We'll talk about that in a minute. Stood the lamb. Aha. This is the conquering king. And with him 144,000 who had uh, his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And uh, we and I heard a voice and you got the new song that comes. But let's just deal first of all with this uh, vision where he fast forwards you to the place of victory. And you see this lamb who is none other than Jesus, who is the Christ, who is now fast forward on Mount Zion, uh, in posing in victory along with his posse. Now, let's let's check, take a look at it. First of all, the text mentions the lamb who is Jesus, but the one hundred and forty four thousand. It would seem to me uh, that the one hundred and forty four thousand in chapter 14 is the same one hundred and forty four thousand we read about in chapter seven. And in chapter seven, 
the 144,000 were those in within Israel representing the tribes of Israel. All right. This does not represent everybody who will ever be saved. All right. The 144,000 were like a remnant. It, want, it, it doesn't even represent all the Jews that will be saved. These special people who are given a special si assignment for a specific season during the tribulation period, this 144,000 in chapter 7, like I said, you have them and now you have them here. Matter of fact, I want to read chapter 7 for you to remind you of it. Two verses there. Chapter 7, verse 4 and... Uh, and to show you that the 144,000 don't make up everybody, all right, uh, you have also a number that no man can number. Let me read that for you. Chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. You see that? All right. And then he not, he lists the tribes of Israel, but Israel is just one nation among many. God promised Abraham that through your nation, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. So God is not just factoring in one nation, but with 144,000, the text says, out of the tribe of the son, the tribe, um, every tribe of the sons of Israel. But then keep on reading. After he lists the tribes, look at verse 9, chapter 7, verse 9, and then you have another list. And after this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that one, no one, that uh, no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people. All right. See the difference? Verse four, every tribe of the sons of Israel. Verse nine, every nation from all tribes, people, languages, and standing before the throne and before the lamb. So you have two groups here. And these are the ones who are going to go through, as you'll see in chapter 7, the uh, tribulation. So the chapter 7, you have this picture of those who will be before the Lamb celebrating uh, and whatnot, uh, 144,000. And then the number that no one can number who come out of the tribulation, that's a preview as well. And now in chapter 14, you have another picture of, of the Lamb standing in victory. Uh, with the 144,000, I have no reason to believe that this is another kind of 144,000 or another group. It's the same group, it seems to me, that's in chapter 7. But they are a special group. But whatever you say about them, let's just agree that they don't represent everybody who ever gets saved. So you don't have to worry about asking the question. Here it is. Am I one of the 144,000? One of the mistakes we make through this whole book is that we keep asking, am I this or am I that? You know, uh, when it comes to the beast, who is the beast? Who is the false prophet? Who is the false prophet? Uh, and we try to name people. And then with the mark, who got the mark? Who doesn't have the mark? What's the mark? And we try to play this puzzle game. And then with the 144,000, am I one of the 144,000? No, these just represent a group who go through the tribulation, uh, special servants on a specific assignment. The details are not given. And that means that we don't need to speculate. They're a special group for a special season and that are the redeemed by the lamb. All right. Now, not only do you have 144,000, by the way, let me even say this. If all you got is 144,000, as some people say, it's just going to be 144,000 in this special place. If that's all the number, you know what? Then you can give it up anyway. Jesus has been gone for, for over 2,000 years. And you, you already had in the first century thousands of people getting saved. So within 2,000 years, uh, if, if the cap is 144,000, then heaven ought to write a sign and say no vacancies because it's already been filled up. But because there is a number that no man can number, by the way, I can number 144,000. So there is more than that that will be in the kingdom who go through the tribulation. All right. And um, this just represents a special group. Now. What he does is, I want you to appreciate, he brings them up in chapter 7, and he brings them up in chapter 14. And what's going on is, 
there is a play between God giving a preview of victory and then showing this uh, uh, the uh, season of trouble with the with the tribulation. Remember, you got the seal judgments, then you have the trumpet judgments, and then you have the bowl judgments, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and then the bowl judgments. And before each of the judgments are dispensed, God gives a vision of victory. So in chapter six, when you have the seal judgments, before that. Before you see the seals break out, you got chapter five, where there is this heavenly vision of those who are worshiping the lamb and he's worthy and um, he has conquered and he's worthy to open up the seal. So I get this vision of victory where all of heaven and earth are worshiping him. I get that preview. Then he takes me into the trouble. So I look at the trouble in light of that preview of victory. Then in chapter seven, in the middle of the Tribulation, you get this uh, picture that we just read, 144,000, a number that no one can number that redeem who come out of the tribulation. Now, he hadn't finished telling the story about the tribulation, but he breaks in to give you this picture of this preview. All right. And then after the preview in chapter eight, we go into the trumpet judgments. But the trouble in the trumpet judgments has to be read in light of chapter 7 where you have this picture or this preview of victory that no matter how bad things get, understand, look at it in light of the end. And now here in chapter 14, you have another picture standing, the lamb standing on Mount Zion and then with his 144,000, this preview of victory right before we go into what? Chapter 15, the bold judgments, which are the final judgments that usher in the kingdom. God defeating his enemies, delivering his people and establishing his kingdom. Appreciate the pattern, a picture, a preview of victory. Then I go through trouble. A picture of victory. Then I go through trouble. And now here in chapter 14, a picture, a preview of victory. Then I go through trouble. It seems like he's trying to tell me something here. The reason why I'm able to go through whatever it is I got to go through is because I have a preview. I have a, a vision of where God is going to take me that eclipse and that is greater than what I'm going through. That gives me what I need to endure the trouble. Like so, Christ in the church has given us a vision of victory. If you go all the way to back to chapter two and three, where he writes to the churches before he starts talking to the churches, he gives a vision of himself that is greater than what the church has to go through. God always does that. He gives you a vision of himself that's greater than the valley and the vicissitudes that you have to go through that guarantees and says, hey, you can keep on. Your faith can keep you keep on going on. Why? I got faith to endure because I have a vision that's greater than what I'm going through. Don't allow yourself to be reduced to what you're in the middle of. That that's all you see. Don't become preoccupied with the trouble that you don't that you lose sight of the preview of where he's taking you. God will give you a preview of victory to reaffirm your faith. So you have 144,000 there standing with the lamb on Mount Zion. Now, before I go to Mount Zion, I want you to see how John deliberately connects 13 and 14 so you can see the contrast between the two. There is the contrast between the beast and the lamb. There is the beast, 12, 13, and then the lamb in 14. All right. And he wants you to see, yes, you must see the enemy in light of the conquering king. Beast and lamb. The beast in chapter 12, going into chapter 13, stands on the sea. Here in chapter 14, the lamb is standing on the mountain. Beast standing on sand, on the sand, and the lamb standing on the mountain. Sorry. Then you have in chapter 13, the beast has followers. In chapter 14, the lamb has followers. In chapter 13, the beast has a mark for those who follow him. In chapter 14, the here, the lamb has a seal on the forehead for those who are following him. The beast uh, has followers on the earth called earth dwellers. 
those who are connected only to this world and, and have nothing beyond it. But then you have the lamb who redeems his people from the earth. The only difference is that those who follow the beast are sellouts. And, but those who follow the lamb are sold out. Those who follow the beast are sellouts in that they said, well, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll worship you however you want, Mr. Beast, and allow themselves to be suckered into deception because all they consider is this earth and they'll do anything to survive. These are the kind of people who will look at the word of God and when the word of God puts them in an uncomfortable situation, they'll say, yeah, I know what the, the word say this, but I got to live. And, and think about the irony of that. You, 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 you talk to the God who gives you life and tells him that I can't listen to what you say because I got to live. Think about how insane that is. But this is what they do. All right. They are sellouts who will do anything to survive. All right. And then they buy and purchase because they are able to buy and purchase. Why? Because they have bought into the, the beast. But in this ch chapter, you have those who have been purchased by the lamb who are sold out. The sell out and the sold out. So you see there is a deliberate connection. There is a deliberate uh, contrast between the beast uh, who is a counterfeit and the lamb who is a conquering king. And the question becomes, whose side will you be on? All right. All right. And then as you see this picture, they are standing with the lamb. Let me read again. Then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb with and with him, 144,000. Know that they are standing with him on this picture on Mount Zion. Before I go to the Mount Zion picture, I want, uh, let me say this. Uh, in order, this chapter is given to encourage you. Chapter 12, you saw the enemy. Chapter 13, you saw the enemy. And now he says, okay, now let's come up for air and let me encourage you. I don't want you to get so inundated with your enemy that you don't see your victory. But see, what the way he does it, if you don't uh, look at this in light of the conquering king, and all you see is chapter 13, and all you see is the enemy, you're not going to be able to cash in on your encouragement. The reason why some Christians are depressed and disillusioned and uh, discouraged to the point of, I don't want to, what's the point of doing all of this is because I've allowed myself. I know about more about headlines on CNN. I know more about the presidential uh, candidates. I know more about the coronavirus than I do my conquering king. Let me say that again. I know more about what's going on on the news, CNN or whatever you're watching. I know more about what's going on with the uh, coronavirus or I know more about what's going on with presidential elections and candidates and whatnot. I can tell you more about that and my conversations are more about that than my conquering king. And if you can tell me more about all of that than you can the conquering king, you are setting yourself up for dis disillusionment and discouragement and depression because you are reading about the enemy. You are stuck in chapter 13 and you're not looking at 13 in light of 14. You are not looking at the uh, counterfeit beast in light of the conquering lamb. If you're going to cash in on your encouragement, you can't get stuck with the beast in 12 and 13. You have to look at it in light of this vision of those who are standing with him on Mount Zion. You don't have to settle for victim status because you have a God who gives you victory. Now, he stands on Mount Zion. Mount Zion represents not only it's God's holy hill. When you see Zion throughout the Bible, it, it represents at least three things. One, it's the meeting place between God and man. Uh, back in Psalm 48, there are Psalms that sing about Zion in Jerusalem, God's holy hill, the place where he meets his people. The second thing that it represents is, it's the place from which God dispenses blessings to the nations. But the third thing it represents is, it is the place from which God determines the destinies of the nations. Let me say that three, three these three ideas that come up with this 
a mountain idea, this hill idea. Number one, it is the place, it is the meeting place between God and man. God, this is the place where God meets his people, Zion. This is what makes it so special. And then two, it is the place from which all blessings flow. So the king comes and he blesses and it's from this place that blessings come. All right. And then the lamb. And then you have is also the place where the destinies of the nations are determined from the holy hill. Look, and, and this is the idea. Though the enemy has been doing whatever he's going to do, you have kings of the earth and enemies of God who have come against uh, God's anointed. And what God does is he sit, Christ comes on, uh, sits on his mountain and he says, you can do what you want to do, but at the end of the day, I'm going to have the last word because I determine the destinies of the nations. I got the last word and I will have the last laugh. Uh, I, I want to show you this. Psalm 2. Psalm 2 gives you a, a quick picture of this, of God's anointing and the Mount Zion and the Holy Hill and, and God having the last word and all of that. Psalm 2 kind of gives you that. Uh, uh, let's look at Psalm 2. And uh, matter of fact, let's just read 1 through 7, okay? Psalm 2 verses 1 through 7. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Let's talk about conspiracy. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Against who? Against the Lord and against his anointed. All right. And the ultimate anointed king that's coming down the line, as we see, will be the lamb, Jesus the Christ, the ultimate anointed one, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. We want to be freed from the one who has come to set us free. Hmm. He who sits in heaven, ha ha, laughs. And when God laughs, it ain't funny. And the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king where, where? On Zion, my holy hill. You guys have been plotting and you guys have been scheming and you have uh, concocted a conspiracy to overcome the Christ. But at the end of the day, I set my king on the holy hill and he's going to determine the destiny. Look at verse seven. I, verse seven. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give Make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. And the only hope that they have, all right, he says, this is your hope for all the kings who of the earth and all those who want to challenge him and all of the nations. He says, this is your only hope. Let me give you wisdom. Verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. This is a picture of worship. Bow to him who bow to, believe in, bow to, say, I belong to you. That idea, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quick and kindled. Go back to chapter Re uh, uh, chapter uh, 14 of Revelation. So what you have in Psalm 2, my holy hill, it is the place from which God determines the destinies of the nation. In chapter 13, we saw this picture where the beast wants to determine the dragon and the beast uh, come together with a plan to take over God's world and it looks like they're winning because chapter 13 does not end with a resolution. It looks like he's winning. But chapter 14, we get this picture, of this preview of the king Mount, on Mount Zion who determines the destiny of the nation because he has the last laugh. He has the last word and then he brings his people there with him who don't represent all the folk who are the people who will be uh, connected but with him, but the 144,000. This gives me hope. Why? Because I do not have to reduce myself to the um, status of the Elijah syndrome. Remember Elijah, he's going to feel like, hey, it's, I'm the only one out here. And he gets so depressed and it's like, man, ain't nobody out here serving God. There's nobody but me. And 
it looks like the kingdoms of the world are winning, Jezebel and Ahab. I mean, I'm the only one. And God had to set him straight. I got some folks out here. I got a remnant of people out here who have not bowed the knee to Baal. I always reserve worshipers for me. One thing you should never get caught up in is the statistics that they have about how many Christians and it's less Christians here and it's more Christians and it looks like Christianity is losing and we live in a post-Christian society. Don't allow the statistics to, to form your perspective. You have to look at 13 in light of 14. And he says at the end, yes, I saw 13 where it looked like all the world was coming to the beast. It looked like in, in uh, chapter 13, verse 16, he causes the earth, uh, uh, people from great and small, rich and poor, slave and free. It, this is a worldwide massive re rebellion, a worship that's wrapped up in wickedness. It is overwhelming and it looks like everybody is going over to the side of the beast. So it seems if this is how it's going to end in 13, everything we do is not, it, it's, it ain't worth it. it it's, it's not worth it. Jesus died for nothing. He rose for nothing and he's coming back for nobody. Let me say that again. If all I have is 12 and 13, I have a Jesus who died for nothing. He rose for nothing and he's coming back for nobody because what's the point of dying and rising again to redeem people when everybody's going over to the other side? And he says, let me give you 14, which shows you, and I'm just going to give you a little piece. 144,000 don't represent everybody, but let me show you. Just let me give you enough to know that I'm on Mount Zion and I'm not by myself. I got a group of people who will worship me because I preserve worshipers for myself. And because I'm going to get victory in the end, this reaffirms your faith for right now to evangelize, to go out and reach out, to, to tell people about Christ. And in the face of looking like I'm on the losing side, understand that God is doing some work and he's not giving you a memo every five minutes on what he's doing, but just know at the end that he will come out victorious and he will not be standing alone on Mount Zion. He will have a posse with him. Every victory that the enemy celebrates is a premature victory based on false headlines. Um, it was in 1948 the uh, presidential election was between Harry Truman and um, uh, Dewey, Thomas Dewey. And during that election, Dewey just knew he had it. And I mean, he was just really overconfident. He really thought this led to a premature victory. I mean, why wouldn't he win? Uh, he had already become, he was a successful, he had won a govern, governor as governor of New York uh, successfully. Uh, he he didn't think Trump was, I mean, <laughs> Truman was uh, too much of a challenge for him. Why? Because Truman had, uh, the only reason Truman was in was because Roosevelt died. So it's like, nobody really voted for you for president. So it's like, I got, and then the press was uh, boosting him up. Man, you're going to win. This is the guy. Everybody thinks he's more polished. He's more educated than Truman. Why wouldn't he win? And... The Chicago Tribune, they made the mistake of celebrating too early. They put out the headline, oh, we know we're going to win on election night. They're going to ran the newspaper for the next morning with the headlines about Dewey uh, defeating Truman. But they did it before the results were finally in. And on that next day, you know his history, Truman was the president and uh, Dewey was the one who lost. So he celebrated a premature victory and it was based on false headlines. That's not the last time we've seen that. And I'm not going to know election this year and all that. I don't, don't, don't reduce this to that mess. But what's going on here, the same idea. We're going to see this picture again. It's going to be played out. Every time Satan celebrates, every time Satan thinks he has an up on God, at the end of the day, it will be based on what? False headlines. The only difference between what happened back there in 1948 and what's going to happen at the end, Jesus, the conquering lamb, doesn't win because he's voted in. He wins because he has conquered and he conquered through his death. 
He conquered through his burial. He conquered through his resurrection power. He's not a president that gets voted in. He's a king who won the victory by coming down here and uh, putting on the suffering and taking on the suffering and the sin of his people, coming out on the other side victorious and by the power of the spirit, bringing a group of people to himself to the end where we can't even count how many they are. We just get a little piece right here of 144,000. And at the end, he wins. And by the way, the results are already in. It was conquered. It was won at the cross, at the cross of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, let me put it like this. The reason why he can stand on Mount Zion here is because he hung out on a hill called Calvary. Let me do that again. The reason why he can stand on the mountain as the conquering king is because he hung out on the mountain or on the hill called Calvary and won the victory and became our everlasting redeemer. Every victory that the enemy thinks he won is a premature victory. So he gives me a preview of what he's going to do in order to reaffirm my faith. Not only do I see that, but I also see a song that the 144,000 sing. This group of people uh, who he has redeemed. Uh, and they were singing. Notice the text there in verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven and like a loud roar of many waters and like a sound of thunder. Think of, look, And then uh, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Uh, the roar of waters is, is easy for uh, and the sound of the thunder. I want you to allow yourself to think about how uh, that would command your attention. If all of a sudden roaring waters like this and then the thunder and then that this is right after chapter 13 where you had this massive vision of people worshiping this false counterfeit beast and now the conquering lamb comes with this surround sound that come it's the, the picture is that he comes with this vision that captures your attention so much that it's like I can't pay attention to what happened in 13 no more because now this this vision of my conquering king with this sound and with this song has captivated all that I am. So the picture becomes where you're going to give your attention. Don't give your attention to 13 to the point that you miss out on the conquering king who now commands all of my attention with the roaring of the waters and the thunder and all and the music that is playing of the new song. Don't allow the enemy's tactics and his conspiracies to drown out the music of heaven. Notice the song. He says, I singing, they come singing a new song. Now, when the Bible talks about a new song, the reason why they sing a new song is because God has done a new work of salvation. And, 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 and he wants you to sing about it. All right. Uh, you, 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 you don't just go and act like ain't nothing happened, but you stop. When God has done a new work, you sing a new song. So now this new work of salvation with these 144,000 that are a special group that give special service during a specific season, particularly the tribulation, they're going to be singing a new song for what God did for them and what God did through them during this most intense time. And by the way, let me say, you ain't got to have a song. The text is going to say, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000. But don't feel like you get left out because you got a song on your of your own. God gives all of us a song to sing because there is a story about what he did through you and what he did for you. And out of that story comes your song. All of God's people will have a song. I may not have the song about going through a tribulation or I may not have the song that Paul has about what he went through and I may not have the song that John has about what he went through, but I got a song and all of God's people got a song that is connected to the situation and the story that he used you and he worked in you and worked for you. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior, you will have a song. So he gives you a preview of those who go through the worst time. And if he can give them a song, 
And if he can carry them through the worst of time, here the question is, what can he do for you? I'm getting this preview of victory. If he can carry them, he can carry you. If he can give them a song, he can give you a song that is connected to a story. Uh, by the way, let, let me say something about uh, this this uh, distinctiveness. Uh, matter of fact, let me let me go to John. I want to show you something in John chapter twenty one, which has nothing directly to do with this text, but I want to show you something. But for those who feel like I'm missing out because I ain't one of the 144,000, God has different kind of people. He has the church, and then he has the 144,000. He has those who are going to go through the tribulation. So from the time that Jesus left to the time he comes back, all of us have different places and spaces that he wants us to serve him. We all don't serve the same way. You know that from the way the Holy Spirit just does with the church where everybody doesn't do the same thing. If all of us were doing the same thing, one of us would be unnecessary. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just give everybody the same thing and the same way and the same specific service, but you have been distinctly designed to give God glory in a specific way. And you don't got to be worried about what somebody else is doing. or what, And that's the that's half the problem. I really can't get to what God got for me because I'm about 144,000. But God has something distinctly for you. I, I, I just want to show that to you. John chapter 21, uh, verse 18 and following. John chapter 21, verse 18 and following. This is an interesting uh, thing here. Jesus is telling uh, the disciples about their destiny. Check it out. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. He's talking to Peter, by the way. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Notice what Peter does. Peter's turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who also had leaned back against him during the uh, supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? This is probably John. So Peter looks back at John and notice what he says. When Peter saw, saw him, he, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Now, I just got to telling you about what's going on with you and how you're going to serve me, how you're going to glorify me. And the thing that comes out of your mouth is what you're going to do for him. Notice how Jesus responds. The master teacher says, Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remains until I come. What is that to you? You follow me. I'm going to read that again. Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. The, the reason why we can't get into what God has called us and run our race and, and focus on the finish line is because I'm all interested into what everybody else, who the 144,000 am I, well, what they going to do and what they, instead of focusing on. I may not be 144,000. I may not have their specific song. I may not be called to go through what they're going through, but God got me where he wants me right now. I got the trouble that's tailored for me. I got the problems that are suited for me. I got the situation and the story and the service that God has tailored for me. And what I need to do is I need to drink my own Kool-Aid. Can I say it like that? I said I need to drink my own Kool-Aid. As one old preacher in Memphis saying, drink your own drink. Oh, I wish I had a witness here. But but that, that's what I'm telling you. And this text is saying, yeah, there are people that I'm going to save during the most intense time. And the point is not you're going to be one of them. The point is if I can save and preserve and give them a song when they go through trouble to this degree, then what can I do for you? If I can do it, when the, the tribulation is described as a time that has never been and never will be. And if God can gain victory for himself and gain this number of people who will serve him during this time, what can he do for you? The same power that is available for them during that time is available to you. So I ain't got to worry about am I them and what they going to do. The question is, where does he have me? And how am I serving him in ways that are worthy of him? I guarantee you, if you give your life to that, it, it, it'll hold you for a lifetime. 
So they sing a song based on their story. All right. Which gives us hope that he gives us a song. He gives us a story. Now, not only do I see the, uh, the vision of the conquering king, but let's look at quickly the value of the conquering king. The service that they give to Jesus, these 144,000, speak of the value they have for him. Let me say that again. As we read this, you need to read that in light of this. Um, faith for the finish line, enduring faith. The reason why I need to know uh, I can make it through this thing is not only because he's victorious, uh, you know, and he's great and he can carry me through, but I need to know he's worth it. That, that's, that's a value. And she shows, she says, let, let me show you how these people show how valuable I am. Through their service to me, they show their value for me. How valuable. Matter of fact, your value of something or someone will be seen in how much you're willing to sacrifice for them. Not, not merely how much you give, but how much you're willing to give up. Your value of something or someone is seen in how much you are willing to sacrifice. Well, let's see. During this time, how much are they willing to sacrifice? Verse 4, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. That's the first these. And then you have a second these. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Then the third these. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. Their service for God reflects their value of him. All right. Your value for someone is shown by how much you're willing to sacrifice and not just how much you're willing to give, but how much you're willing to give up. And he's saying during this most intense time, during this tribulation, not only will I gain a number 144,000 and the half hadn't been told, but with these 144,000, there will be those who will value me and, and have commitment to this degree who will show my worth and show my value. Now, of course, you're asking the question about the virgins. The, set, the first, these, these are those, that they, they show their uh, value of him by their purity. They keep themselves from women. They are virgins. Now, there are a lot of people who take this different ways. Um, this is one of the reasons why I know that... Uh, if it well, what the first thing is this one way you take it is that we're talking about just physical sex they don't have sex at all with women they don't even get married you know they 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 never get married so they have sex with nobody because they're not married the only problem with that is he calls it defiling it's like don't defile yourself with a woman so that wouldn't necessarily fit somebody who's married and having sex because the bible doesn't describe sex with your wife or, you know, in, in a husband and a wife as defiling. Um, so some take it as physical sex. And if it's physical sex and they are virgins, um, I know that this doesn't fit me. All right. And pretty much everybody else that I know and all of you who have had children, if this is just talking about, if, you, if you're going to make this about we the 144,000, all right, and then this is literally about not having sex with nobody and not getting married and all of that. Uh, then it's a lot of us. Everybody who had children through having sex, that you ain't going to heaven. You ain't going to be there with it, okay? So it's got to be something other than that. Like one, all right? So, so the other view is that he's talking about sexual immorality. They kept themselves from sexual immorality. That would be adultery, fornication, and whatnot. And, and so it was a, so there was a, they didn't defile themselves like that. That could be. Then another way to take it is because of their special service to God, all right? They did not engage in sex, period, because of their special. So in, in the Bible, you have those who uh, saved themselves. In Deuteronomy, you have those uh, who were warriors. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, who during that time could not help because of their special service, they reserved themselves. And then you have Jesus in Matthew 19 talking about those 
who serve me who don't engage in sex because of their special service. And you have in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where there are those who Paul talks about who remain virgins because of that and, and whatnot. So for a special service, though that could be in light of the fact that they do have special service. The third uh, idea could be that he's talking about spiritual adultery. That is having an affair on God. These people who kept themselves pure from the pagan cults, from the wickedness and the worship and the deception. Think about chapter 13. Think about uh, also the church going through and being tempted uh, to be a part of these, um, this idolatrous connection, you know, this counterfeit worship that includes unfaithfulness to God. All through the Bible, one of the ways that the Bible speaks of unfaithfulness is this spiritual adultery idea. I'm having an affair on God, and not only am I having an affair on him, but I'm using his credit card to finance the affair. That is, I'm using the stuff that he gave me in order to cheat on him, all right? So that may be what we're dealing with here, a spiritual adultery. So whatever the situation may be, uh, the, they keep themselves pure. Uh, they keep themselves from cheating on God. We can at least say that much. All right? They are faithful to God in their purity. Then, not only do you have that, but you have their pursuit. The text says, not only are they pure, but their pursuit. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. The idea of following him means that we are going to promote your agenda. We're going to abandon our agenda and we're going to be of, of advance the agenda of the king in their pursuit. Uh, his death becomes our death. His role becomes our role. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. And his reign will become our reign. And his residence will become our residence. We, we become connected with Christ. Where the cross not only is a substitute for sin. But it also becomes a strategy for life. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his suffering. They follow. They follow the lamb. All right. But not only do they follow him, their pursuit, but I see their purchase. These who have been redeemed. They didn't redeem, redeem themselves. And from mankind as first fruits. That's a term for sacrifice. Their lives now become a sacrifice. Similar to Romans 12 where it says present your bodies a living sacrifice. And this idea of first fruits of uh, giving a token to the king to show this is how much I value. This is your, this is my worth. I give you my life and what I give up, I give it to you to show that you are worthy of even my life. And so, so you have this idea of, uh, of the, the conquering king who receives worship at this time where all of the world seems to be going into false worship. He said, wait a minute, I'm going to preserve a people for me. I will not uh, have a world where I will not be. So you ain't got to worry about uh, God losing and not having anybody and your mission ain't worth it. He's saying, no, I'm going to have some people who worship me and not only worship me, I'm going to have some people who are committed to me and live in a way that shows that I am worthy. Now, let me be quick to say that this is not saying, the text is not saying in order for you to get to heaven, you can't have sex with nobody. In order for you to get to heaven, um, you know, you you follow God to get to heaven or any or something like that. Well, my works or what I do gets me in right relationship with God. The text says they are redeemed. They have been purchased. The, the word there means something that they didn't do for themselves. This is something that happened to them. So the reason why they are faithful, the reason why they value him is because they are responding to the redemption that Christ has given them. Uh, so I don't, I don't serve him to get saved. I serve him because I am saved. My works are a result of my redemption. Don't get it twisted. Don't go around telling people, if you do this and if you do this, you'll make it in. No, the reason why you make it in and the common denominator between us and them is that what? They are with the lamb. It's not because they're Jews. It's not because they so holy. It's not because of that. But the common denominator between us and them is that they are redeemed by the blood of the lamb. 
The question becomes now, why do you do what you do? Why, why do you serve him? And there are a lot of people you need to put yourself in check because there are a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm going to serve God. And I'm going to give this and I'm going to give this up. But the reason why you're doing it is because you listen to some prosperity from the telling you if you do this for God, he's going to give you a house. Or if you give it for God, he's going to give you some kind of breakthrough. And all you're looking for is some temporary thing that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. You need to serve God, not because of what you're going to get or because of some American dream. You need to serve God because you value him. Not because even you getting into heaven. You need to serve him because your name is already written and because I value you. And the reason why I value you is because of the value you put on me. Because you redeemed me and bought me when I was nothing and when I was nobody, when I was a sinner, when I was on my way to hell. And you picked me up and looked at me and saw no reason to love me at all in and of myself, but love me anyway and brought me into your grace and changed my life. And because of what you've done for me and because of what you are doing for me, I'm going to show it with my life and value. That's the connection between, and you ain't got to be no 144,000 to do that. You just got to be redeemed and appreciate the fact that he reached down and changed your life. You are not do it because of somebody else who's going to give you an applause or somebody who's going to appreciate you. And that's why we run out of fuel sometimes looking at the finish line because I'm looking at they ain't going to do this for me. And you know what? This is the last time I'm going to do something. Well, who are you doing it for? Are you doing it based on what you're going to get from them? Or are you doing it based on what he's done for you? Whatever they give up, it's because they value the king and he's worth it. He's worth my life. He's worth all that I have. So I see that he gives me a vision, a preview of what he's going to do in order to reaffirm my faith for the finish line. I end with this. It was uh, Timothy Woods who uh, heard, I heard this about, heard this uh, idea about this uh, in 1968. That was the Olympics in Mexico City. And there was the man by the name of John Aquari who, who did the marathon and as he's running the mar marathon, he's from a place, he's from Tanzania. And as he's running the marathon somewhere in there, he fell, he, uh, he cramped up, he dislocated his knee. And uh, it looked like he wasn't going to make it. Everybody else kept on going and whatnot. And then after everything looked like it was over, it was hours after. He, he, this guy with the cramp, uh, the cramping and the dislocated knee. Here he comes. Hours later, the awards had been given out. The TV cameras had been taken down. Uh, the crowds were leaving. The night was coming. And all of a sudden, you heard the announcer say, ladies and gentlemen, please enter the stadium. Please re-enter the stadium. Come back. The last runner is coming through. What? I thought you he dislocated his knee. I, Huh? What? What? No, come on back in. The last run and coming through. And although everything was over and everybody was gone, he kept running and said, I'm going to make it and went to the finish line. Everybody clapped and applauded. They interviewed him and asked, hey, what, what's up with that? Why? Why? You know, you had a dis. Everybody would have understood why you would have given up and didn't finish. We understand that. You, you didn't have no control over that. Why did you keep on going? And everybody was gone. Why didn't you go to the why did you go to the finish line? He said this. He said, Well, my country, I come from Tanzania. And he said, and they did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race and not finish it. And then he said, This. I come from Tanzania. And people did a lot of things for me to get here. And there was a lot of sacrifice that had been made. And because of the sacrifice, it was too much of a sacrifice that was made to get me here for me to just start and give up. I leave that with you. You say, why do you keep on going? And why going on to the finish line when it feels like uh, it's futile, when it feels like you're not winning when it feels like this stuff is worth it. When you feel like you want to give up, when you feel like I could be doing some other things and, and, and whatnot. And, and, and why do I keep on with my family? Why do I keep on with this job trying to 
uh, tell people about Christ, these friends and people who won't even listen to me? Why do I keep on serving God and trying to love folk when I don't get it back? Why do I keep on celebrating and having joy and celebrating God when it seems like there's nothing to celebrate? Why do I keep going on to the finish line in the midst of the assaults that come? Why don't I just go to just throw in the towel. He said, yeah, this, this is the same thing he says. He says, look, mm -mm. no, John says, no, I'm going to keep going on. But I got a vision. And, and, and too much has been done for me. Too much of a sacrifice has been made for me to give up. When he got on that cross and died and gave all that he had. Because he's not asking me to do something for him that he's not already done for me. Too much of a sacrifice. And he's too worthy for me to start and being quit. I'm going through. I'm going through. No matter what others may do. The song says, world behind, heaven in view. Praise the Lord. I'm going through. Don't look at your situation. Look at what's around you, what's behind you. And think that you're going to find the encouragement to keep going on. It's not there. The encouragement is looking at your Christ, the lamb. It's not going to be looking at the enemy, the beast who's uh, on the sand sinking. It's going to be looking at the, the lamb who's on the mountain, who is the rock himself and will get you to the destiny. And if he can do it for them, he can do it for you. If he can hold on to those who are going through the most intense time and come out with those who are living a life that responds to the redeeming the redeeming work of God. He can do it for you. So you keep on going on. You keep on. You keep on pushing. Two invitations. Some you say, well, I have not even joined the race yet. If this is a good day for you to enter the race. The way you enter the race is you got to be redeemed. The way you get redeemed is by accepting the sacrifice that has already been made for you the person and work of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here's where you fit in. Whoever believes on him should not perish and, but have everlasting life. That's where you get into the race. You trust Christ that he has done for you. You don't trust Christ by saying, oh, I'm going to do better and I'm going to work on my sex life. And oh, I'm going to try to follow God by uh, treating people right. All those things. No. No. The way that you get in connected contact with him is by being redeemed by the blood of the lamb and when you accept him then he'll give you the assignment for you he'll say this is what i got for you you ain't got to worry about what i got for somebody else but i got something deliberate distinctly designed for you that i want you the way i want you to give me glory and he'll be worth it it'll be it'll be worth it the journey will be worth it so if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, go ahead and do that. Believe on Jesus Christ. Give us a call. We want to hear and celebrate the new life that God has given you. Secondly, you've not a part of a church home and God has put it upon your heart to be a part of this church family, this community. You want to be connected spiritually, uh, although we are disconnected socially. Uh, I want you to give us a call. I believe uh, that we'll be glad to have you. If you call us, you can have a family. Uh, that will love you, that will love you to death. And then if you just need some prayer, just call us and we'll celebrate your victories. We'll walk through um, whatever you're asking God for. You don't have to walk through this thing alone. Well, brothers and sisters, until next time, you do remember to keep your eyes on the conquering king and don't allow yourself to be depressed by the counterfeit beast because Christ will give you what you need to endure to the end. You be blessed. and friends, let us worship in giving. St. John now offers four ways to give. Give online using Givelify 
at integratefaith.org or simply download the Givelify app. Give via Zelle using our registered number 214-803-6384. Mail or drop off your gifts at our church location, 3324 House Anderson Road in Euless, Texas, or contact the church or your assigned deacon to arrange for a pickup. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I don't know where I would be. Fellowship, let's go. My testimony is real. Good morning, St. John family and friends. Here are the announcements for today, Sunday, August 23rd. Join us for Wednesday night Bible study via Zoom at 7 p.m. Our study is centered around our core value of worship entitled, Our God is Awesome, Encountering the Greatness of Our God, a book by Dr. Tony Evans. If you have any questions, please contact Sister Vanessa Primus, our IFI Registrar. Hope to see you this Wednesday at 7 p.m. The Boas Brothers meeting frequency has changed. They now meet on the first and third Saturdays of every month at 9 a.m. via Zoom. The meetings provide discussions, lessons, prayers, fellowships, and more to assist you in your growth as disciples of Christ. If you have any questions or would like to join them, Please contact Brother E.O. James or Minister Bruce Davis. First Sundays are designated for a special extra giving of $10 for the church property's insurance. Please make plans to give your extra gift on Sunday, September 6th. We ask that the designated giving be over and above your regular giving. Thank you in advance for your commitment to give and to support our local community of faith. On Saturday, September 5th, we will have a drive through communion pickup and offering drop-off if you are unable to give online. The drive through and pickup will be from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. at the church. You will drive to the church and the deacons wearing protective gear will give you the communion elements through your car windows. Then on Sunday during communion, we will partake together with Pastor Taylor. If you have any questions, please contact your assigned deacon. It's time for our weekly birthdays. Please take some time to wish each member a very happy birthday on their special day. Happy birthday to the following individuals celebrating a birthday this week. Happy birthday! Concludes our announcements. Thank you and have a blessed week.